So for this uh, week's talk, I'd like to follow on a little bit from what I was speaking about last week and uh, particularly to give a, a talk on the topic of what gets reborn. And we were talking about this last week and I kind of fudged around it because I knew that if I wanted to try to answer it properly, it would take a bit too long for the time we had left. And uh, we were also discussing this a bit in the monastery. <coughs> so the question of what gets reborn The easy answer to that is nothing. Nothing gets reborn. So that's it. There's the answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't know if that's fully satisfying, though. Nothing gets reborn because there's nothing there in the first place. Okay? You have to remember that this is crucial to it. There's no, there's no thing there in the first place, so there's no thing to get reborn. Right? This is very, very important. And the idea that there's a thing that gets reborn, i.e. that there's some kind of entity or some kind of self-same identical thing, I guess, I don't know what to call it. We use words like soul or self or spirit <laughs> and so on. The idea that there's some kind of thing that gets reborn is not a Buddhist idea. And in fact, of course, it was precisely this kind of idea and kind of way of looking at rebirth which the Buddha was criticizing. Okay? It's not to say he criticized the idea of rebirth as such. He criticized the idea of particular ways of looking at it and interpreting it. He said that they're incoherent. They don't make sense. Right? Why... Why do we care? So the first thing we have to understand, if we want to know what gets reborn, the first thing we have to understand is <clears throat> why do we care? Why do we care about what gets reborn? The reason why we care is because we're afraid of dying. This is why we care. Yeah? We're afraid to die. Because we're afraid to die, we wonder. Yeah? And we wonder what happens. And this is very, very crucial for the spiritual life. What happens when that veil is drawn down, that veil between life and death? Yeah? How do we know what's happening on the other side of that veil? And it's that, that moment which is um, critical in, uh, in, in uh, manifesting our own humanity. Because it's that moment we are all mortal and we are all the same. Kings, queens, paupers, beggars, slaves, warriors, politicians, businessmen, mothers, daughters, Everyone dies. And that moment of death, the unknowing of that is the same for all of us. And so that is a very, it's actually a very, very beautiful moment. And when you, you know, one of the, my privileges as a Buddhist monk is I, I get to encounter people who are dealing with, negotiating, that threshold in life. Yeah? I mean, even today I went to a dana, a uh, group of people who were uh, uh, holding a, a meal offering in remembrance of various relatives of theirs which had passed away. And then from there I went to the hospital, to the palliative care unit, to, to see a fellow who was suffering from a brain tumor. All the family was there, and uh, all just waiting for him uh, slowly to, to pass away. And uh, they were actually very jolly, I have to admit. <laughs> It was very nice. They were very relaxed. Obviously, there was a lot of tension and difficulty, but they were very relaxed and, and quite uh, a lot of smiling. We did some metta meditation. It was very lovely. And so, as a monk, I can see you know, how this affects people. It's actually great for me to give a talk to people who's, who, who, who are at a funeral, because you know, they really listen. Yeah. <laughs> You're really going to pay attention to the Dhamma if you're at a funeral, yeah? So, 
that moment where we step into the abyss, we step into the darkness, and that is the question mark. That's the question that haunts us. Yeah? That's the question that drives us. That's the question which lies behind all of the uh, uh, spiritual seeking and searching in the world. What happens when we die? Now, <clears throat> if we look at uh, or reflect on um, this, you see, well, what, what's actually happening is that we're, we're trying to understand uh, a state that we've never actually experienced. Okay? Of course, if, if the Buddhist idea on rebirth is correct, okay, which is a hypothesis, if that's correct, then, of course, we have experienced that many times, but we've probably forgotten it. Some people can maybe remember, but many of us have forgotten. Okay? So let's assume that we've forgotten about what that experience is like. Or, if the Buddhist theory of rebirth is not correct, then we've never experienced that. So we don't know. Now, normally what happens when we, we try to move from the known to the unknown, okay, we do so by analogy. Okay? We do so by drawing comparisons. Okay? And uh, that is what allows us to, for example, uh, have compassion and empathy for other people. Yeah? Because even though we don't know what it's like to be inside that person's mind, we can reflect. So, for example, if somebody is feeling very sad and maybe they're crying, we don't know what their feeling is at that time. But we can reflect. We know, oh, I've felt that as well. Yeah, I felt sad, I cried. And so you can understand. So this is how, and then we respond in an appropriate way to that situation. So, uh, when it comes to the time of death, we also, our mind also works in the same way. We can't help it. Our mind always works in that, in that way. That's the nature of the mind. It wants to move from the known to the unknown. And it can only do that by comparing the known with the unknown, by drawing analogies, by drawing inferences, okay? by seeking some kind of continuity or similarity between the known and the unknown. If there's a radical and complete disjunction between the known and the unknown. If the unknown is something totally and utterly different from what we know, we can never understand it. We just have to give up. We have to say, that is forever the unknown. Yeah? The unknowable. But perhaps it's not quite like that. For example, we can say that death, and this is a beautiful simile that the Buddha gave in... Uh, um, in the suttas is that uh, if somebody has developed uh, metta and has a very good meditation, then <clears throat> their last breath, the time of death, is just like uh, somebody, a man who's, who falls asleep, gently falls asleep. They've had a good meal, they're very comfortable, they feel tired, they're rested. They just lie down and gently drift off to sleep. So if we, our meditation is very good, our mind is very clear, the time of death is just like that. Okay? So you can see that that's an analogy. Okay? It's something we experience every night, falling asleep. Except we, we kind of don't experience, do we? <laughs> because it's the ending of experience. Yeah? Yeah? But we have some kind of idea what it's like. Okay? It's not exactly like that. But it's something like that. So you can understand this is that by means of analogy. And that analogy uh, in, in formal, um, uh, what we say, uh, in the Abhidhamma terms, in terms of the, the, the technical terminology of Buddhism, um, is actually more than just a coincidence because it involves the same kind of mind state. I don't want to go too much into this, but that mind state we call bhavanga being a state of consciousness which we have in deep sleep and is also a state of consciousness which, which characterizes the, the, uh, uh, the time of death in a certain sense. I don't want to go too much into the details, but uh, there's, it's just to notice that there's, there's more than just a, perhaps, perhaps more than just a coincidental similarity there. <clears throat> 
Now, so if we want to know about the time of death, we have to do that by analogy. Okay? And so we can use metaphors. We say it's like stepping out of one vehicle and stepping into another vehicle. Yeah? Uh, the Buddha said, for example, when he used uh, what we call the divine eye, the power of clairvoyance, to see that process of rebirth of beings, he would see it was as if standing on the first story balcony of a building and looking down on a street. And he could see the houses in the street. And then out of the door of the house, somebody would walk, and walk along the road for a while, and they'd walk into a new house. Yeah? And that's what watching that process of rebirth was like. Yeah? Emergence from one state of being, a process of change and movement, and then entering into a new state. So, you know, to, that's just a metaphor, okay? That's not exactly what happens, but it gives us some indication. And remember that the Buddha was very, very skilled at choosing his metaphors, yeah? Very, very skilled. And so, you know, if we, if, we, if we tease out the implications of that metaphor a little bit, what that suggests, now we think about what is it like, say, for a person living in a house? Well, what it's like is that <clears throat> we have four walls and that kind of defines our state of being for that period of time. We are within those walls. Our movements and activities are confined by those walls and we can do certain kinds of things that are constrained by that, okay? So, for example, we can't start playing a game of cricket within those four walls. Well, we can, but mum's likely to get upset, yeah? So there's certain kinds of things we can do there, certain kinds of things we can't do, yeah? There's certain kind of movement which is limited within certain ways. We then come out of that situation, and then there's a process, a different kind of process, where there's not a movement within one situation, but a movement from one situation to another. Yeah? And then entering into a new situation, okay? where there's maybe a different kind of house, different possibilities. Maybe it's smaller, maybe it's bigger. Okay? And still within that, there's a certain movement. Yeah? And so in that kind of simile, I think that we could, we could understand the, the house as being what we call a bhava, in, in, um, in, in Buddhist terminology, bhava being like a state of existence, a state of rebirth. Okay? So we're born into one state of rebirth, like say the human realm. Here we all are. Most of us anyway. Uh, <laughs> presumably. And uh, so uh, that's... Uh, not meaning to discriminate against any aliens that happen to be in the audience. That's fine. Right? Uh, but here we are as humans. And this has a certain, you know, certain potentials, doesn't it, as human? We have certain things we can do, certain things we can't do, certain capacities, certain limitations, and so on. And according to Buddhism, we can then get reborn in another state. Maybe we get reborn in a heavenly state, or we get reborn as an animal, or whatever it may be. And each one has its own... Uh, characteristic and so that's that bhava and then the stage in between those uh, in Buddhist circles is called the andara bhava is the in between state of course this andara bhava is very controversial in Buddhism and it was formally uh, rejected by the, the Theravadan school, the Sri Lankan school uh, as being uh, uh, not a correct conception and again, I don't want to go into all the technical arguments, but <clears throat> my feeling is that um, uh, actually th those arguments are mistaken and that the, if we look at both the early suttas and also the evidence of uh, supplied to us by modern science and so on in terms of near-death experiences and things like that, uh, as well as meditation experiences from people as far as I know in every tradition, that all of those things seem to suggest that there is, in fact, some kind of in-between state. Although, perhaps, the terminology in-between state is, is, is a bit misleading. Perhaps it might be better to think of it as being in-between the states. Yeah? In the sense that, you know, you're in one home, and then you're, you're not, you move from there along the road into another home. Yeah? Just to reflect on that, the Buddha could have used a different kind of simile. For example, he could have said, 
rebirth is like being in a room in a house and then stepping into another room. Yeah? And if that was the case, we would tend to understand, well, there's no gap between the two. It's just one footstep and you're in one and you're out of the other. Yeah? And that would tend to have that kind of implication. That doesn't prove anything, but it's suggestive, isn't it? Yeah? It's suggestive that there was actually this kind of process, this wandering process, which is not like a state in itself, but is a movement between states. Okay? Now, again, to think back to what I was saying before about an analogy and metaphor. What are we doing in that one state of being? We're in our, in our home. If I want to move from the bathroom to the kitchen, what do I do? I walk. Okay? And so we move around. Now, the way that we move around is not exactly the same as the way that we move when we move from one house to another house. Okay? Maybe we uh, walk faster if we're walking down the street. Maybe we get on a bus. Maybe we ride a bicycle. We move maybe in a different kind of way. But it's still a similar kind of thing. Okay? And we can understand it by analogy. That's the same kind of process going on. Okay? And so this is essentially how the Buddha approached understanding the process of rebirth. Okay? By saying that What's happening in that process of rebirth is the same kind of thing that's happening to us here and now. Okay? It's not to say it's identical, but it's the same kind of thing. And we can understand it by analogy and by inference, because it's not completely other. Yes, there is a veil. Yes, there is that unknowing. But there's not a complete gulf between what we know now, what our experience is now, and what happens when we get reborn. Okay? So, then to come back to uh, the understanding of what is our experience now according to Buddhism. And as I mentioned at the start of the talk, you know, nothing gets reborn because there's nothing here in the first place. Yeah? And this is very similar to uh, the answer that the Buddha gave when he was asked, you know, does, uh, does the Buddha uh, get reborn anywhere? And the Buddha's response to that was, you know, even here and now, then actually there is no Buddha. Okay? So how can there be one that gets reborn? Yeah? So, what's, what, again, what's going on there with this kind of paradoxical argument? So this kind of thing in Buddhism is always... When you hear these kind of paradoxes, you always have to suspect, oh, okay, you know, not self is lurking in there somewhere. Yeah? This is this kind of idea. This is paradoxes of identity. Now, according to Buddhism, what's happening is that we have like this conscious process. Right? As I'm sitting here now, I see. Okay? That seeing is always changing. Okay? I look around the room, I see different people, people are shifting a little bit. That sight is never exactly the same. Even if I just sit and stare at a blank wall, still it'll be changing a little bit. Yeah? Maybe the way that the eyes are focused will change. Yeah? Something will be changing. And so that eye consciousness is never the same. And we can't pinpoint one thing and say that that thing is eye consciousness. There's no entity. It's just this process of awareness. We can analyze and understand this process of awareness. And similarly with the ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. When we look into our mind, what is there that stays the same? The more and more we look into the mind, the more and more we realize there's nothing that stays the same. We think, thoughts arise, they disappear. We remember, memories arise, they disappear. Perceptions arise and disappear. Imagination arises and disappears. All of these things are coming and going. And there's this very, very complex web of activities going on. Now we take that complex web of interrelated activities and we say this is the mind. Okay? We give it a label. Why? Because we can't say I changed my web of interrelated activities. You know? We have to say I changed my mind. You know? You have to use a word, yeah? And uh, so it's just this language for convenience sake. And so Buddhism, we always understand that these words we use are just for the sake of convenience. Uh, they, they shouldn't be taken as being uh, absolute 
and fixed truths. Now, when we start to talk in this way about uh, an interrelated web or flux of activities, then uh, you know those of you who may be familiar with with uh, modern science would would of course notice similarities. And of course, there's many similarities to the way, for example, that atoms and subatomic uh, particles and so on are perceived and and since the time of quantum mechanics we don't think in terms of lumps of stuff anymore so we're not made of lumps of stuff you know when we read what you know say Heisenberg or somebody would say that that a, a, um, a like an electron is is like a probability field you know there's no it's not actually a thing which exists in one state at one time but uh, we can we can simply talk about probabilities and potentialities and so on. And so our notions of the material, the physical world, have become very, very tenuous. The further and further we go there, and then we start getting into strings and all kinds of things which are, get more and more weird the more we go into it. Now, why is it, or how could we possibly come to such an advanced and sophisticated way of thinking about the physical realm this lumpy stuff which sits here, right, and yet still insist that the mind or the soul is this one kind of self-same, identical, simple thing, yeah? Okay, understand? We have to appreciate that the mind also is very complex it's, and it follows similar processes. If anything, Certainly, according to Buddhism, the mind is far more complex, much, much faster to change, much more subtle than the physical realm. Okay? And this is certainly the Buddhist way of looking at these things. And in a similar way to the physical realm, we look at it, it looks like an entity of, of solid stuff. The closer we look into it, the more it dissolves. Okay? Until we realize, actually, it's just space. Movement of energies in space. That's all it is. And we can't even define them, we can't even define the movements clearly. And similarly, the mind is just, it's not a thing, it's a movement of energies, okay, inside, and again, just by analogy, we use the word, we can say inside a mental space, okay, a movement of energies within a mental space. Of course, that's all just analogy. Movement is, is analogy. There's nothing moving. Yeah, energy is just an analogy. Yeah? Empty is just an analogy. Space is just, it's just try, ways we try to talk about these things to convey some kind of impression. But when we look inside, that's why it's so crucial to do meditation. When we look inside the mind, you can see that, can't you? you, can, you if you're a meditator, you'll understand what I'm, what I'm talking about. Yeah? You'll, you'll appreciate, yes, this is actually what I experience. Now, what the Buddha said is that the process of rebirth doesn't involve anything other than what you can experience here and now. Okay? We don't have to postulate any other entities in order to explain the process of rebirth. Okay? And again, if we want to take an analogy from uh, um, you know, the, the physical sciences, uh, uh, say in, in uh, uh, say, I was trying to think of a good example. Um, <clears throat> say in Aristotle, he believed that, you know, this basic quandary, if we're trying to explain the physical world, there's a very simple quandary. One is if I drop a, a, an apple, it falls down. Right? Stars don't fall down. Why not? Right? So Aristotle's answer, and this was current for thousands of years, was that they don't fall down because they follow different rules. Okay. The rule about things falling down applies here. Another set of rules applies up there. Yeah? And of course, Galileo came along and said, no, that's, that's wrong. Actually, they follow the same sets of rules, but they just occur in different kinds of ways. And we can actually understand the movements of the stars and so on through, under, through appreciating the same principles of gravity which we can experience here and which we can measure here. We can apply them to the heavens and actually see how it would work if we change the way we look at it. Yeah? This is called like a paradigm shift. So uh, we have to do that same kind of paradigm shift within the mind so that we can understand, okay, by analogy, how is this going to work? Now, how does that uh, 
uh, when, we, when we speak of the mind, the Buddha talked about this in many different kinds of ways. Okay? Uh, so one way, say, the five khandhas, the five aggregates, form is a physical body, feeling is a sensation, pleasant, painful, neutral, perception is like a kind of memory or recognition of things. Uh, intention or volition is sankhara and uh, consciousness, vijnana, is the awareness of all those other things. So these five aggregates, the Buddha said, is grouped like a hand. Okay? They grasp things like a hand because consciousness, like the thumb, is aware of all those other things. Okay? That's why he called upadana khanda, the grasping aggregates, because they grasp things. Consciousness grasps things helped by those other four. Now, if we look at, for example, again the question, what takes rebirth? All of those things had been given as the answer to that question Okay, in the time before the Buddha. Some people said that what takes rebirth is a physical thing. Okay, What takes rebirth is the little man the size of a thumb who lives inside your chest. Yeah? You know that one? Little man the size of a thumb, he lives inside your chest. Yeah? And he is yourself. Yeah? And when you fall asleep, what happens is, you fall asleep. Yeah, her mouth hangs open. A little man comes out. And he goes wandering around all the universe, having all kinds of adventures, falling in love, having fights, doing all kinds of things. And that's what your dreams are. Your dreams are actually the, little, the adventures that the little man has when he's wandering around the world. And he flies all over the place, having these adventures. And then eventually he gets tired, and he closes his wings like a bird returning to the nest. And he flies back down inside your mouth and comes inside. That's why you should never wake anybody up suddenly when they're asleep. Because if they wake up, then maybe the little man won't be able to get back inside. <laughs> yeah? So this is a self theory. This is a theory of the self. Okay? It's a physical kind of self. And sometimes people, physical self might be the breath. Okay? Very literally. You know, if you look in, say, Genesis, you know, God breathes a breath into Adam, and then that's it. That's, that's life. That's the soul. And that was a very, taken very literally as an animist view. Melinda Panha... It talks about that. There's a, there's a certain uh, someone says the breath is the self, and then somebody says, well, what if you're a trumpet player? <laughs> do, you, do you lose yourself every time you, you blow the trumpet? Yeah. And it's, oh, hang on, I didn't think of that. Yeah. So we have these ideas of the self which start out, but the idea that the breath is a self is not a ludicrous idea because, of course, we're breathing while we're alive, and then when we die, we stop breathing. I mean, it's not. It's not nothing irrational about it. We stop breathing, we die. And where does the breath go? Well, obviously the breath has left our body and maybe it goes somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. And this is what we, we, we call the word spirit. The spirit, word spirit, of course, is related to the old word to breathe, like respiration. Yeah? It's the same root. So the word spirit literally means the breath, the same as prana in Indian thought or uh, chi in Chinese thought and so on. So this is a very common kind of view. But of course, when you start to investigate these views, you realize, well, that's not really adequate, is it? It doesn't really hold water when we start to think about it. Feeling. So some people say, well, what, what, you talk about rebirth in terms of the kind of feeling. I'm going to go to a realm of bliss. That's what we want, isn't it? Yeah? After death, I'm going to be happy. Go somewhere happy. Or after death, I'm going to be sad. I'm going to burn in the fires of hell yeah? and just experience suffering. But then this also is kind of problematic because we investigate what is the nature of feeling. The nature of feeling is it's always conditioned, it's always impermanent, it's always changing. And we don't experience just happiness. So we can't say this happiness is myself because sometimes the happiness is there and sometimes it's not. And so we'd have to say sometimes myself is there and sometimes it's not. Yeah. And so we go. And this is the kind of analysis that the Buddha would give of different theories of the self, okay? which range from very crude, animistic theories to very, very subtle and sophisticated theories. The most sophisticated theory that was around in the day of the Buddha 
was the theory that the self is the consciousness, the vijnana. Okay? And this was a, a theory which was first articulated by one of the greatest of the Upanishadic sages, Yajin Valkya, uh, probably about one or two hundred years before the time of the Buddha. And he gave some extremely beautiful and powerful uh, dialogues uh, where he would move towards this conception. He would talk about the unseen seer, the unheard hearer, the unthought thinker, the uncognized cognizer, the unknown knower. Yeah? This is yourself. Yeah? When everything else is gone. Yeah? And then the self, he would talk about this um, immersion. He used this word, Vijnana Ghanameva, is this sheer mass of consciousness. Yeah? And so this is this idea, this sheer mass of consciousness. So, and that was described. He contrasted this Vijnana with, as it's like an ocean, this ocean of consciousness. And then what he called Nama Rupa, which you'll be familiar from Buddhism, if you know Buddhist philosophy, Nama Rupa, name and form we translate it as, is like the rivers. So you think each river has its own name, its own shape. Yeah, It's coming down the mountain, we call it such and such a river. And they all get immersed into the great ocean. They lose their name and shape in that ocean of Vijnana. So this was the teaching of Yajnavalkya, a hundred years or two hundred years before the Buddha. It's a very beautiful teaching, isn't it? Yeah, I find, I find it's very beautiful. Yeah? It's very profound. Yeah? He's not talking, you know, he's moved a long way from these kind of idea of the man the size of your thumb. Yeah? And the Buddha said, no, no, even that's not good enough. Yeah? Even that's not good enough because an ocean is an ocean. Yes, yeah, fine, it's an ocean, but oceans dry up. Oceans are not permanent, they change, they have currents, they move. Yeah? It sounds like it's a very beautiful and powerful simile, but actually when you, look, when you start to look at it, you realize also this is not good enough. Consciousness also is changing. The way that we know is also changing. The quality of awareness changes. This is that change in consciousness. We investigate this through our meditation. This is what you're doing each time when we meditate. At the end of the meditation, I ask you to reflect. How do you know what is the quality of awareness at the beginning of the meditation and the end? Not what is the things that you're aware of, but what is the quality of awareness itself? That changes. That is the changing of consciousness. And when you understand that, you can never say, well, it is this same consciousness which gets reborn. So this was a, a phrase which was used by one of the uh, monks in the time of the Buddha. He said, it is that very same consciousness, not another which gets reborn. Okay? Tadeva vijnanang nanyang. Tadeva vijnanang nanyang. And the Buddha was very, very scathing in his criticism of that monk. He said, no, you can't say that. Okay? Consciousness is originated from conditions. Okay? We can't speak of that very same consciousness, not another. Even here and now, this is an incoherent notion. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up with experience. Even here and now, we can look into our mind, into our body, experience what consciousness is, and we know that it's always changing. So how can we speak of that very same consciousness and not another? Okay? And so this idea of this constantly changing process. Now, when we begin to understand the body and mind like that, actually it makes perfect sense in the case of rebirth, because rebirth is a change. Okay? Now, one of the most bizarre things about Buddhist philosophy, and this is brought up time and time again, and I find it very curious, is people say, how can you explain rebirth without a self? And people have said this so many times. But actually the problem is, how do you explain rebirth if there is a self? That's the problem. Because a self is something that doesn't change. Rebirth is itself a change. How can you say a changing process is explained by means of a changeless entity. This is completely incoherent. It's so incoherent that not only did the Buddhists uh, uh, use that critique, but even some of the sophisticated uh, Hindu philosophical schools accepted this Buddhist argument. And they said, yes, you're right. Yeah? The self cannot be involved in the process of rebirth because the process of rebirth is impermanent, it's unsatisfactory, it's subject to change. There is a self, yeah, 
according to these Hindu thinkers, there is a self, but that self doesn't have anything to do with rebirth. Okay? That self is absolute and changeless. Yeah? Okay? So this is to show that that Buddhist critique that says actually the, the, the notion of self cannot underlie the rebirth process is actually a very powerful one. And so the, the best simile for this is the simile of the fax machine. So I've, I've told this many times here, so forgive me if, I've, if you need to hear this again. But anyway, the fax machine, originally invented, as far as I know, by Bhante Gunaratana, was the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, creator of the fax machine simile. Now, what happens when you send a fax? You get a piece of paper with writing on it. Okay? Now, the, write, the piece of paper is a physical thing. The writing is also physical. Yeah? It's ink. The writing encodes information in a meaningful way. Yeah? We can pick it up and read it, and we understand what the writing says. That information, the meaning of that is not physical. Okay? The meaning of that is something which arises when in the interaction between consciousness and that page. A, n a person who knows that, knows that language, reads it, and in that interaction, meaning arises. So that meaning is not a physical quality of the paper itself. Although it's, it's, it's conditioned by it, it's affected by the physical quality, it's not independent of it, but it's not uh, limited to just the physical quality. Now we take that physical piece of paper, we bung it in the fax machine, dial the number, goes through, fax appears at the other end. Now, if you know a little bit about the physical process of what's going on, uh, the machine scans the paper and encodes that image in terms of a binary code or some kind of code. Let's assume it's a binary code. I don't exactly know how the encoding works. Now, then that binary code, when the connection is made with the other fax machine, is then sent. Now, that might happen immediately. It might not. The other fax machine might be out of paper and it might take a while for the fax to come out. But that doesn't matter. And this bears on the question I mentioned before about the in-between state. Actually, it doesn't matter whether there's an in-between state or not. It doesn't affect the nature of the process. It's just a question of timing. So, fax goes in. It's recorded in the binary code. The binary code, we say, is transmitted from one place to another. Actually, nothing moves from one place to another. Okay? Electricity doesn't move anywhere. We, we think of electricity as something that flows from one place to another. But actually, there's no flowing, there's no thing that moves down the electricity line. Okay? What moves is a pattern of energy. Okay? And so we can recognize that the same pattern of energy is there at the start as is there at the end. Now then that pattern of energy is then retranslated from by the second fax machine as instructions for a printer, prints out the new piece of paper. That new piece of paper doesn't share one atom in common with the old piece of paper. No, there's nothing physical in common with them whatsoever. And it's also true that the, the writing, the physical writing on the page is never exactly the same. The image is never exactly, there's always some loss of image quality in the transmission. So it's not exactly the same as the original. Yeah? But the meaning of the words is the same from the beginning to the end of the process. All of those changes happen, and yet the meaning of the words is the same. But of course, when we say the meaning of the words is the same, that's a very problematic way of talking because one person picks up that piece of paper, that means something to them. Yeah? The other person picks it up, it means something to them. Okay? So in a sense, the meaning is the same, but it's also quite different because it's different in different environments. If, if, if the meaning of it, if it's just a thing of saying Sam's phone number is blah, 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 well, that probably means more or less the same thing to both people. But if it's a verse of poetry from Shelley or something, it might mean quite different things to the people at different ends. Yeah? So that's very contextual. Okay, so we can understand that the, 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 nothing moves from one to the other, nothing physical moves, but the information is transferred, and the information is, is the bearer of meaning. Okay? Now, how do we explain this? The way I've talked about it now in terms of physical process is analogous to how Buddhism would explain it. Okay? There's a process that goes on. It's an impersonal process. Okay? It's just nature. Soul theory says... Inside the fax machine, there lives a little man the size of your thumb. 
right? When you put the paper into the fax machine, he reads the paper, tries very, very hard to memorize it, and when it's finished, he runs all the way down the telephone line, run, 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 to the next fax machine, he gets a piece of paper and then writes it out, trying to copy your handwriting, yeah, as best as he can, and then sends that out of the next fax machine. That's the soul theory, yeah? And this is the difference between the soul theory. The soul theory doesn't explain anything, okay? All it does is give a word to the process which makes it sound like it's been explained, yeah? But it doesn't explain anything. The Buddhist uh, explanation explains it because it works from analogy, okay? And just as with that fax machine, we don't know actually in terms of the physical fax machine, we don't know exactly what happens unless we're electrical engineers or something like that. We only have a vague idea of what happens and yet we can understand it well enough yeah, by analogy. And so all that explanation I gave is using analogy. The, the message moves or the information flows or something like that. These are all analogies. And so similarly with the process of rebirth, we can't know directly what that process is unless we have maybe some kind of psychic ability or ability to recollect our past lives or something. Yet we can know by analogy. It's a similar kind of thing to what's happening here. And so it has all of those elements. It has a physical element. Okay? Now we can see this from, for example, from near-death experiences where, let's say, somebody's lying in the hospital bed you know, they have brain death or something like that, and, we, and, they, and they, they report the experience that they, it feels like their, their mind rose out of their body and they were up floating above their body and looking down. It's a very common near-death experience. Well, what's happening there? Well, obviously, there must be some kind of physical aspect to that process because there's a location. The person feels they're actually located in a certain point, and location is a physical property. They can see Seeing is a physical activity, okay? You have to have some kind of physical thing there to be able to see. What kind of physical thing? Well, obviously, we would think in terms of maybe an energy field or something like that. Now, that's just a vague word I'm throwing out. I don't really know, okay? But when we understand that actually even ordinary matter is really nothing more than organized energy, yeah? then we're maybe not going to be so resistant to the idea that energy can organize itself in other forms, which are maybe not so obvious to us. Okay? And so, uh, so there's some kind of physical thing. There's a feeling. Okay? So uh, again, if we think of those descriptions and near-death experiences, we've all heard of those, then people typically feel very happy, feel very blissful. Yeah? And so there's a feeling. This is Vedana. It's one of the five aggregates. So we can understand that experience by analogy with what we experience now. Some people say that the, the experience of bliss is similar to the experience of samadhi. Yeah? And I know one monk who's actually had both experiences. He's had jhana experiences and he's had a near-death experience. And he said that they're very similar. Yeah? So <clears throat> this is very interesting. <clears throat> Just as a word of warning, not everybody has pleasant near-death experiences. Yeah? It's difficult to work out the proportions because the ones who have unpleasant ones tend not to talk about it so much. Yeah? Uh, for example, one that I heard of was someone who after death uh, had the uh, experience or the feeling that they were uh, on a road, desert road, uh, where there was nothing but a flat, parched desert from horizon to horizon and a straight road running along. And they were lying down on that road, nailed through their hands and feet down onto the road with uh, an, a vulture uh, eating their intestines. So one might want to reflect about karma and its results in that particular context, but I don't want to linger <laughs> on that kind of example. That's just a story I heard, okay? So, but feeling is involved. Perception is involved, yeah? One of the five aggregates, yeah? Perception, because there's a process of, 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 of recognizing things. We understand that process. For example, we recognize people that we've met before. We, we see what's going on. We, we make sense of that experience. And this is all within that realm of perception. There's a certain aspect of volition involved because sometimes people can will to go in one direction or another or they make a choice. Maybe they meet somebody and somebody says, no, no, it's time for you to go back and they have to make a choice to return. These kinds of things. These also happen. <coughs> 
And of course, there's consciousness because there's awareness of the whole process. Okay? So when we see and we read of those near-death experiences, which we learn from the modern medical literature, then we can understand them in terms of those uh, Buddhist categories of experience like the five aggregates. And we could use other kinds of experiences. We could use the six senses or different ways of analyzing that experience. Okay? But the point is that it's not something completely different. It's not the same as what we have here. We're not floating up into the sky you know, and then feeling, seeing the bliss of lights and going. To, we're not having the same experience, but we can understand it by analogy. Okay? So this is uh, the B a Buddhist answer to what gets reborn. The easy answer is nothing gets reborn because there's nothing here in the first place. What happens at the time of rebirth is that the processes of mind and body which, we, which make up our life, which we experience every day of our life, every minute of every day, those processes change. They go from one phase into another phase, but they don't become anything radically or completely different. Okay? They're affected by conditions and they change according to that circumstances. And we can understand what that change is by understanding what is happening to us right here and now. So this is my little talk for this evening on what gets reborn. <laughs>